My name is Devin, and welcome to module. Right. So I'll take it from there. Um, I'll share my screen and start my my PowerPoint. You can hear my voice and see my screen, I assume. Um, so great. Um, and uh, I thought that was an excellent uh, introduction, uh, Devon, to sort of the, the way of thinking uh, relationally. And, and I'm a geographer coming into this from, from human geography. And uh, yeah, in geography, <laughs> relational thinking is all the rage, as you say. Um, but it's not just about because because the sort of the, the we've decided so within the, this particular discipline. I think it really relational thinking is really um, uh, let's say popular, but um, um, is really. Uh, um, has sort of become mainstream now because because I think of globalization because of of of, um, of uh, the way we organize society in in, in networks you know uh, Manuel Castells work on network society has really been foundational I think to a lot of of, of of thinking so so basically it's about if we try to understand something in society we don't just understand it as a separate entity separate from other other from anything else. Uh, but we need to understand it um, uh, through its relationship with other things. And that's really important to try to understand cities and what cities are doing. And I, I, I want to pick up from, from the TED talk yesterday that I uh, know you had a, um, a good and critical discussion of, uh, where towards the end, uh, Robert Mugger is, is talking about sort of solutions and what cities are doing. Um, and it's really talking about saying the smartest cities are nicking, stealing, which means you know, taking ideas from others uh, about how to go forward. He's talking about these coalitions, as he calls them, uh, which, which are networks um, between cities. He mentions C40, ICLE, and says these movement, these are the movements of the future. Um, then it talks about um, this idea of uh, sort of the parliament of mayors and things like that that are maybe taking this idea a bit too far. But, but um, what, what this really is about is to, to try to understand how, how cities are, so to, I mean, with the question of why are cities doing what they're doing in terms of sustainability? And why are some cities um, sort of more progressive than others? Um, the answer very often comes down to, to looking at how they are embedded in networks, how they're learning from other cities. And, and, and I got really into this when I started looking at, at particular cities, uh, including the city of Bergen, uh, where we started to trace to see, okay, why, why is you know, uh, the city of Bergen um, focusing on this particular sector or promoting this particular solution? Well, we could very often trace it back to some some uh, some uh, project that they had with other cities, or some network that were part of, that they were part of, um, something they were inspired by, and then take, took that idea to Bergen and then tried to implement it uh, here in in our city. So I think this this goes a long way to to, to explain um, sort of the. The, the development of, of policies uh, on sustainability in, in, in cities. So, so what I've been been talking about and writing about um, a lot for the past few years is, is what, what we could call a relational approach uh, to cities. And that's the title of the lecture today. And, and, and I, um, I'm going to ex explain a bit more what, what, uh, what this means. Now, in the video that we showed yesterday, we uh, we were at the, one of these mobile points, <coughs> uh, and uh, uh, the mobility hub. And this is a picture from uh, from a different one, just the the top top left one there. Uh, so Bergen has these mobility points um, around in the city, uh, where you can access uh, shared vehicles, you can charge electric vehicles, you can access uh, electric bikes. Um, you can access public transportation, and you could tr try to sort of study what, how did the city arrive at this? What, why did the city promote this particular solution? How did it manage to sort of get this through? I mean, in a tight budget where there's a lot of fight for every uh, krone, 
how did some of the bureaucrats and planners manage to convince uh, the politicians that this is something they should uh, put, put money into. We could study this within uh, the, the municipality of Bergen and say, uh, look at that process and who were the driving forces and, and the key individuals, etc. But you cannot really understand the emergence of this type of, or, or this particular uh, intervention in Bergen without looking at how uh, the, it, it came about through a, a network with other cities. So the idea of, of, uh, of the Mobilpunkt um, comes from other cities. I mean, I, I think it, it traces back to Hamburg as far as, uh, as, as, far as we can understand. Um, and uh, Hamburg uh, had this idea and, and started promoting this idea. And, and then um, uh, they managed to, to, um, to form an, an e and get funding for an EU project, an Interreg project funded by the European Union where they looked at, at how to combine uh, different forms of sustainable, uh, sustainable mobility and how to promote that in the city. Um, and the, University of, uh, sorry, the city of Bergen really got its uh, um, um, idea for this, not just idea, but got resources for this um, and got sort of a, a stimulus, inspiration uh, for this through, through this network. And when we look at, at uh, how these processes work within a city, we see that, of course, there's a lot of struggle within a city of what should we do, uh, even within sort of the, the climate and sustainability departments uh, of, of a city, there's disagreement, should we be doing you know, uh, energy production, should we be focusing on green space and parks, should we focus on mobility, different people have different opinions. Um, but once you come with a, a network and resources with, and collaborations with other cities, you come with EU funding, that really forces something through. Uh, and and uh, I think it's a, it's a big part of the explanation for why uh, Bergen uh, ha has this particular solution. I'm not saying this is the ideal solution uh, for, for uh, mobility uh, challenges, but it's just, as an academic, interest, an interesting challenge to try to understand why did they choose this particular one and uh, this this network with other cities is definitely uh, a key reason um, for that and now <coughs> uh, other cities uh, are coming to Bergen to look at Bergen's mobility points to see how it's they're being operated here um, and at this lower left uh, picture you see uh, Lars Uwe Kvalbein there in the blue jacket uh, he's the main um, sort of um, he's the main uh, person in the municipality of Bergen driving this. He's an enthusiastic person, very charismatic person, um, and and he's here. He's he's giving a, um, a a talk to visiting to visitors, plan, planners visiting from visiting from different cities in Belgium to come, who come to Bergen to try to, to 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 learn from some of the things that Bergen has done. So, um, yeah, so um, uh, it's, it's really, I mean, the bigger questions here, I think, are really about, so how, how and why are cities adopting sustainable policies and, and how and why are they adopting particular sustainable policies? There are so many you can choose, right? Um, and some of them are, are better than others in terms of equity and, and, and social sustainability and others um, have, uh, yeah, so they, so, so it matters a lot what type of um, uh, sustainability measures we, we, we choose. So it's, 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 it's um, an important uh, research uh, task, I think, to, to try to understand why cities are choosing the, the ones that they're choosing. So then this really has to do with learning between cities and networks. And at the core of it is what we call, would call the relational approach. Yeah, I think I'm, I'm going to skip... Um, over this, but um, yeah, I'm going to skip over this. So, in a, the bigger issue here, and um, the um, uh, lecture yesterday had this uh, gray li gray literature report uh, on the on the reading list deadline the deadline 2020 report from from C40, and that report I think is quite interesting because it tries to 
to to look at the um, the cities that are attached to the C40 network, which I would say is probably the best funded uh, of all of these intercity networks. It's it's funded by uh, Michael Bloomberg, uh, this billionaire uh, who was the uh, the mayor of uh, the mayor of New York City and uh, and and spectacularly unsuccessful candidate for president of the United States. Um, and this, uh, but but of course the the network is much much bigger than than him. And I think his role doesn't really matter that much. But um, but this report, I think, is quite quite advanced in 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 many ways. And and one of the um, one of the interesting uh, figures in here is the one I'm showing now, uh, which they 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 looked at different actions that cities can take. Uh, and divided them into what are the the actions that cities can can do uni, unilaterally, like where cities have the, the 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 mandate or the power to just do it themselves without any type of collaboration. Um, and on the other hand, these policies where or or interventions and and and, and initiatives where cities need to collaborate with 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 other cities, with regional authorities, with national authorities. Um, and, and 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 try to see um, wh where do the cuts in CO2 emissions need need to come from. And as you see from the figure, they estimate that these um, measures, where uh, cities can act unilaterally, can account for five percent um, of the um, uh, the measures uh, that are uh, would be necessary to to stay within the, the two degree targets and uh, the ones that they can deliver through collaboration would, would constitute four to six percent interestingly even both of these would in, in com combination would not be enough uh, but still there's a big difference between um, urban action uh, or and and cities uh, doing nothing uh, which is the bau the business as usual scenario So some of these um, networks and coalitions um, are, are depicted here. These are just to, to, to bring up some of the examples of, of these networks that cities are, are engaging in. And they're quite, um, qu quite different in, in, in profile and, uh, and, and purpose. And they're quite different in terms of who's, who's driving them and, and other you know, top down, bottom up, et cetera. And we're going to look a bit at that uh, in the hands-on workshop later on. Um, but just wanted to highlight some of the key, some of the key networks. ICLE, um, the Covenant of Mayors, which is uh, really uh, driven and funded by the European Union. C40, which is a coalition of originally by the, the 40 of the biggest mega cities in the world. Um, but it also has sort of subsidiary uh, groups of cities that are not, you know, big mega cities, but are still large cities that want to do something about uh, climate change. Um, energy cities, uh, Civitas, which is another uh, EU initiative, etc. So there's a, there's a lot of these different coalitions and networks between cities, and, and cities are typically engaging in, in many of these at the same time, right? So. If you go into, if you study one city, uh, you might meet one planner who's actively engaged in one of these networks, and you go to the next office, and they are very engaged in another network. Uh, so, uh, is, you might ask yourself also, is there sort of a network uh, overkill? And I'll get back to that when we when we talk a little bit about the literature um, assigned to today's course. Um, so in my, the, the article that I s assigned to this course um, that I have from, from my own work, um, I, I tried to divide, uh, the question is sort of where uh, are urban energy transitions governed and by where they're governed, I mean what are their, the, the geographical patterns here uh, in, in the governance structures. And I tried to make a division between well, three different types, um, vertical, horizontal and infrastructural. Um, but I think for this, for the purpose of this lecture, I'm just dividing between vertical and horizontal here um, to, to sort of highlight that difference. And that I would say the traditional way of looking at sort of urban governance would be to see that, say, that cities will be the vertical, so that cities are um, sort of 
at, at the bottom of this hierarchy of governance levels where you have the urban municipality um, and then the regional region, regional authority and nation states, and you can go even further up. Um, where I think with a relational perspective and with this literature on policy mobility and, and, and uh, network society and all this, we're, we're looking more and more sort of shifting our ontological perspective in a way uh, on, on cities and, and many other um, uh, social phenomena towards a more networked horizontal uh, perspective where we look at these uh, interrelations that are happening between people, between actors, between organizations and between cities that are not necessarily structured uh, within this uh, vertical, um, yeah, vertical structure. Of course, the world <laughs> is more complex than this and, and both of these things are happening at the same time and have always done so. You know, you can you can trace intercity networks to to back to the Hanseatic League uh, in the 14, 15, 1600s. Uh, so so there's nothing new about policy mobility or or relational perspective. Uh, but but um, um, uh, but 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 it's sort of a shift in emphasis on on both in how the world is structured, but also the academic perspectives on on, on the world. And for me as a geographer, and I think this is a, an academic that has, has had reach way beyond uh, the, the discipline of geography, Dorian Massey, um, who uh, is a pleasure to read and, and I would recommend you, you, you try to do so uh, if you have a chance. But she's really one of the, at least for geographers, one of the sort of intellectual uh, core, uh, intellectual, um, key intellectual figures in this, this way of thinking relationally. I mean, she, she studied London. Um, and, and has written about London in a way that doesn't just describe London through what's going on within its city borders, uh, but describe London as, as this combination of all the relationships that, that form London, inclu including, say, immigrant uh, diasporas and the relationship that these immigrants have to their home societies, uh, or their, uh, the societies of, of their origin and how that plays into shaping London. So really, description of London. I mean, of course, it's a philosophical argument, so description of any city, basically, uh, as as this um, assemblage, if you will, of of relationships with with other places. And you can't really understand London or most other cities if you don't take into account these these interconnections uh, between between other cities. And I like this quote that places are social relations, uh, including local relations within the place. So not to forget those internal relation, relations within places, and, but, but also those many connections that stretch away beyond it. So I think that's it's a good, good quote. So, yeah. Um, so I want to skip to, to, to the readings uh, and say a few words about that. And we can, we can discuss that more in, in, um, uh, as, at, at the, in the discussion. But, but um, the, the readings I have designed, uh, assigned to this, this lecture um, are intended both to, to, to explain what this, what this sort of perspective on urban sustainability and urban change is, uh, but also to provide a bit of a critical perspective on, on, on that. So, so um, there's, um, there, there are several literature Sort of, um, trends that are looking at this, particularly one I would say that we call policy mobility, uh, which was uh, which has been um, uh, well, necessarily started, but has kind of it's sort of the original. Some of the original texts come from uh, Jamie Peck, um, uh, where the idea is really to 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 try to understand. Uh, as I've been talking about, how how policies are are, are traveling and how 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 political entities are um, interacting with one one another and 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 how the, these these ideas are are, are flowing, um, and they're really looking at it through both as a as a phenomena, trying to describe the phenomena and and try to understand um, how uh, this is happening. Basically, what I did with this mobile punkt example in Bergen. But also take a critical perspective on it and say, see who, so who is part of shaping policy then, if this is how policy is being formulated, right? 
um, not everyone can take part in these intercity, international um, policy processes. If that's, if that's how things are happening, um, how democratic are these processes? And they really have studied, um, uh, I recommend a book called Fast Policy, which is not about cities in particular, but it's about um, sort of development policy, conditional cash transfer, for example, where they really um, show how policies and ideas that were uh, originally came out of, of, of social movements um, and, and NGOs had been sort of adopted by national governments and then by multilateral organizations such as the World Bank, sort of taken out of their context, um, reformulated. Um, and their argument is that they've really tried to fit these, these um, policies that, have, that had sort of a progressive radical base um, uh, into to, to fit um, neoliberal frameworks, basically, is their argument. So there's a lot of, of interesting texts uh, there, um, both both sort of charting this trend um, and, and being critical towards it. And I, I assigned this paper by Astrid Wood uh, on, on bus rapid transit. So I think bus rapid transit is a very interesting phenomenon in this context because it's it's really um, at least portrayed uh, as emerging from the global south, and I'm sure that's that, that's true. Um, and um, also has this south-south uh, circulation between cities in in Brazil, uh, um, um, Colombia, and and other places you know, traveling to south to to to, to South Africa, um, where where planners between these these cities in the global south um, have learned from one another, and it's now sort of spilling over to to. Uh, uh, to, to the west, to the global north. Uh, actually, uh, Stavanger, <laughs> where Sid is sitting at the moment, uh, they're adopting a, a bus rapid transit. Of course, not they're not calling it bus rapid transit; they call it busway. But it's 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 the same 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 concept, basically giving exclusive lanes to to, to buses uh, the same day, way that you would with um, uh, metros and, and and light rails. But doing it with buses makes it uh, can make it cheaper. Anyway, so 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 I think that's um, uh, that, that comes out. This comes out um, from from this wood paper, like both description of the phenomena, um, this interesting BRT example, but also a, a, a critical perspective on 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 uh, on policy mobility. And uh, the other paper, um, Harriet Bulkley, uh, is it's it's a bit of an older paper that. I would say uh, was written before this kind of policy mobility literature uh, emerged, uh, but it's also one that's quite critical of this um, th this flow of ideas um, because it's looking at it in a disc discourse perspective, um, which means looking at how these uh, what are the power relations involved in, in producing these ideas and communicating these ideas? So, so, so she takes this idea of best practice. And if you, if you read anything about cities and uh, urban sustainability, you come across this, this idea of best practice very often. You know, uh, Copenhagen, for example, it's cycling policy, it's, it's best practice um, that others, other cities can, can emulate and, 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 and model. So she discusses this idea of, of, of best practice and, and, and basically asks, so who defines uh, best practice? Um, what, what, what sort of power relations go into this, this definition? Uh, and, and, uh, and what happens then when a particular uh, way of understanding best practice, uh, it becomes a model, the Copenhagen model, for example, it travels to different places uh, and, and, and um, local planners basically are, are kind of pushed and stimulated to, to, to adopt a particular model uh, in, in their city uh, without necessarily uh, thinking about how, how does it fit in that local context. Right. 
So, yeah, so, uh, and then you have these definitions. Uh, I think this, this idea of the, the world's most livable cities is, is, is quite interesting. You have this, 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 these uh, figures and charts coming up every year. You know, uh, now Melbourne is the most livable city, Copenhagen is the most livable city, Bergen is the most livable city. So who defines these metrics, right? This, uh, Sid will come back to metrics later in, in the course. Who defines what is, is the most livable? And, and then, but you have a definition. Um, and uh, when city, Bergen was in one survey a while ago, uh, named as the most livable city in the world. And of course, they put it on the website and they, they really sort of advertise that, oh, we are the most livable city in the world. So you, you get into this competition, uh, but on whose terms and who have defined uh, what, what these, these metrics are and, and, and what, what defines a livable city. And I think if you look beyond, there's been, uh, you know, if you look below these, these definitions, it, it, it really um, comes down to kind of, um, yeah, um, you know, providing, <laughs> providing a certain type of lifestyle for, for the middle class. At least that, that, that's, been, that's been one argument that has been, been proposed. But then um, there's also a shift in this discussion, and I'm getting towards the end now. Um, because and this is where, where I have, um, uh, with some colleagues here, um, also sort of contributed. <coughs> because yes, you have this, uh, as Boltley is saying, as, as, as others are saying, yes, there is a, a discourse here, a powerful discourse here of best practice, of models, um, which is a certain top-down, elite-driven um, uh, uh, process. But when we have studied these, these cities, and, and um, um, uh, I, I put up uh, Jennifer Robinson's paper on this, because, which is shorter and more um, to the point, I think. But we've also written about this within sort of the smart city discourse. Um, when we study this, we, we've seen that local actors and people in cities, local planners, are actually quite critical of these larger discourses. I mean, they are inspired. Um, they take, they take, um, yeah, they take ideas, but when you look at the actual implementation in cities, uh, local planners and cities are, are quite, um, I think, quite um, sensible to to what what fits in uh, in their city. And what Jennifer Robinson is talking about in this paper is, it's not like, you know, the policy mobility literature has looked at one particular policy and looks at how that travels and how that kind of lands in a particular city. But if you look at it from the city perspective, like if you're standing on the ground in a city, that city is part of, of numerous networks. Um, and the ideas and resources from these networks are kind of being fought over in the city. Uh, so there's a very, um, there's a process here of policy formulation, uh, which she calls arriving at, not just arriving in, which Jamie Peck would say, uh, you know, the Copenhagen cycle model would arrive in Bergen. No, I mean, Bergen arrives at uh, pol policies because it, it, it negotiates between lots of different networks, lots of different resources, lots of different ideas. Um, and, and I've been writing about this uh, because I think that gives us a more, uh, that, that provide, gives more agency to, to the two cities. And cities are quite, you know, instead of describing cities as kind of receiving uh, receivers of these international ideas, I think they're much more active agents in 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 in, in picking and choosing between different policies and and really debating what what fits within within our city. So yeah, so good. I will um, stop there, and uh, and uh, hopefully that gave some some um, some food for thought and and a basis for uh, ba basis for discussion. Um, we have yeah. 10 more minutes and I'm happy to take, uh, take questions. I'm gonna stop sharing.